Good morning. I want to uh, talk today about some research that I've done in collaboration with Deb Poole on psychotherapist beliefs about recovered memories. But I want to begin by giving you a little background, a little context. I approach this issue of recovered memories of childhood sexual abuse from really two different perspectives at the same time. On the one hand, I'm a cognitive psychologist, and my work for the last eight or nine years has focused on memory errors, memory delusions, memory intrusions. And that background and, and perspective has led me to be very concerned about the kinds of memory recovery techniques and practices that have become popular in recent years. But on the other hand, I also approach this issue from the perspective of my own sort of personal political bias. And as a scientist, I, I think it's important to sort of acknowledge and mention that bias, which is that of a leftward-leaning, pro-feminist person who is deeply concerned about the reality of childhood sexual abuse. Now there's a tension between those two perspectives, but I want to argue very forcefully that they are not contradictory. Indeed, I think that we must approach this issue from both perspectives at the same time. Having this dual perspective has led me and my work with, with Don Reed and other collaborators to try to communicate with, rather than merely attack, therapists. And it's also led us to try and approach this issue within its historical and, and numerical context. And very briefly and, and somewhat crudely, I think that context is a history of thousands of years of male-dominated societies in which the sexual abuse of children occurred but was largely ignored. And a more recent, very recent, i.e. in the last couple of decades, movement toward an increased awareness of the reality of childhood sexual abuse and an attempt to do something about it. In terms of the numerical context, it's my belief that there are good grounds to speculate that highly suggestive forms of, of memory work have led thousands and perhaps tens of thousands of people who were not abused to come to believe that they were abused. And this is obviously an incredibly important problem. But again, we must keep this in, in context. The best available evidence suggests that even when childhood sexual abuse is very narrowly defined, say limited to gross physical contact sexual abuse of young children perpetrated by adults, there are millions of people in North America who are sexually victimized in those ways. Now, you know, these days we throw around that term million uh, with a great deal of panache, but I think most of the time we don't have any idea what it means. And, and to try and clarify the idea of millions, I thought, well, I'll put a million dots on an overhead. <coughs> but it turns out that you can't put a million dots on an overhead and have it be anything but a nice, even gray. And in fact, only approximately 80,000 dots on this overhead. It'd take about 12 of these to have a million dots. And again, a million would be a, a gross underestimate of the number of people in North America who were, were grossly sexually victimized as children. So this leads me to believe that we must simultaneously pursue the dual goals of maximizing awareness of and sensitivity to and support for victims of childhood sexual abuse 
while at the same time minimizing risks of iatrogenic illusory memories or false beliefs and false allegations. And I believe that we can actually relatively easily do that if we can get some good communication going with practitioners. <coughs> it's my belief that an exclusive focus on one or the other of these goals is likely to lead to undesirable trade-offs. But by pursuing both of them, we can make good progress. One potential problem facing us as we grapple with this issue is that our legitimate concerns may be misconstrued and may also be abused. In my opinion, scientific evidence justifies concerns about suggestive memory work and also justifies a degree of skepticism regarding claims of, of recovered memories. On the other hand, I think it's important to emphasize that, in my opinion, scientific evidence does not justify dismissal of all claims as false. As Linda Williams has just reminded us very clearly, People forget lots and lots of events in their past, and there may be important social and cognitive processes that could conspire to lead people not to remember instances of abuse. And we know that given the proper uh, uh, cues, we can sometimes be enabled to remember things that we have not thought of for years and years. Perhaps even more important, in my opinion, scientific evidence regarding risks of memory recovery techniques should not be applied to cases in which there is no claim of recovered memories and no suggestive memory recovery techniques. That is, we want to keep our issues clear here, and at least from my perspective, the important issue regards highly suggestive, potentially risky memory recovery techniques. Well, what do I mean by that? What do I have in mind when I talk about risky memory recovery techniques? I think we're justified to have very grave concern about approaches to therapy or self-therapy that combine several of the following in a prolonged attempt to recover memories. First, communicating to clients the idea that their symptoms are indicative of childhood sexual abuse, the idea that lots of people who are abused have no memory of abuse, and that psychological healing requires, relies upon, recovering memories. Now, I might mention this communication doesn't have to be overt and cut and dried. It could be subtle and indirect, but just getting those ideas across to clients. Two, using a variety of techniques with the aim of helping people recover memories. I have in mind here techniques such as hypnosis, guided imagery, sodium amytal, stream of consciousness, journaling, uh, use of family photographs as retrieval cues, etc. The basis for the concern about these, of course, is that there is ample evidence demonstrating that these techniques lower people's response criteria, that is, lower the criteria they have on what they accept as memories and what they don't, and they can also enhance people's imagery, thereby leading ideas to be more memory-like for people. Another aspect of, uh, that justifies concerns would be a practice of interpreting dreams and physical symptoms as memories of childhood sexual abuse, recommending popular books on memory recovery, such as The Courage to Heal, or uh, recommending uh, survivors groups for clients suspected of having hidden memories, and finally, endorsing all reported memories of childhood sexual abuse is accurate 
and countering clients' expressions of doubt about the validity or accuracy of the images and thoughts and feelings that they're experiencing. Now, we've got kind of a good news and a bad news story here. The good news is that in recent months, a number of very prominent clinical psychologists and psychotherapists whose work focuses upon helping survivors of childhood sexual abuse, including a number of practitioners whose work has promoted the use of memory recovery techniques, have recently acknowledged publicly and in print that this kind of an approach to psychotherapy is risky and should be avoided. And that is great good news, right? I think, and, and, and a lot of people in this room deserve credit for that progress. The bad news is, is that uh, a number of these people have, have argued that nobody really <coughs> uses these kinds of techniques. Or if anybody does, it's only a, uh, a marginalized fringe group of unqualified uh, uh, people. And the data I want to present today uh, address this issue. Deb Poole and I, in the summer of 1993, uh, prepared a survey. And then later, we got together with Amina Menon and uh, Ray Bull, who are English psychologists, and did a follow-up survey. In these surveys, we, we uh, sent questionnaires to highly trained psychotherapists who regularly conduct psychotherapy with women clients. And we focused on the highly trained psychotherapist because, again, this, this group has been uh, uh, argued to be least likely to use suggestive memory recovery techniques in their practices. The first survey, we randomly sampled a national sample of practitioners from the National Registry of Health Service Providers in Psychology, which is a relatively prestigious organization. All of the members have doctoral degrees in clinical psychology or allied disciplines, and all of them have state licensure for psychotherapy. The data from that survey consists of 86 respondents who fit our criteria of people who regularly practice psychotherapy with women clients. Then a few months later, we followed up with a second sample drawn from the same pool, as well as a companion sample of British psychotherapists. And again, these are highly trained, uh, uh, registered psychotherapists. Our estimated return rate of the people from our initial random sample from these directories who were in our population, approximately 40% of them returned the, uh, the survey. Once again, we have kind of a good news, bad news thing going on here. Here's the good news. The results indicate that the majority of these highly trained doctoral psychotherapists do not have a central focus on childhood sexual abuse. For example, the majority of them indicated that childhood sexual abuse was an issue with only a small percentage of their women clients. On the other hand, the majority also indicated that they at least sometimes form the clinical judgment that clients who report no history of childhood sexual abuse were in fact abused as children. And the majority, about two-thirds, indicated that they believe that remembering abuse for clients who have a history of abuse is an important goal for psychotherapy. And the majority also listed indicators of childhood sexual abuse. Indeed, about 82% of the, 
of our respondents across the three surveys listed indicators, that is, symptoms that they believe are indicative of a history of childhood sexual abuse. There's little agreement across respondents as to what the indicators are, and across the sample, we got quite a number of indicators. Now, there's no way you're going to see this overhead, but it'll make a, a point. The slightly bigger print lists the 22 different indicators that were listed by at least 5% of the respondents. And one point that's worth emphasis here is that there was only one indicator that was mentioned by more than 16% of the respondents in all three samples. Only one indicator for which there was an agreement of more than one in eight uh, uh, respondents. And it's rather interesting that that indicator is adulthood sexual dysfunction. And if I have time, I'll return to that, why that's interesting uh, a little later. The fine print down here lists the additional 63 indicators that were listed by fewer than 5% of the respondents. This list covers a rather broad range uh, starting with adulthood sexual dysfunction, but ultimately ending up at things like dad was strict, dad was alcoholic, uh, or born-again Christianity. Finally, the, or not finally, next, the majority of respondents indicated that they at least sometimes use memory recovery techniques with the specific aim of helping clients remember childhood sexual abuse. Across the three samples, 71% indicated that they at least sometimes used memory recovery techniques, and 58% reported use of two or more different techniques. It's also important to emphasize that there was very little agreement across respondents as to which techniques should and should not be used to help clients remember childhood sexual abuse. We asked, we gave subjects, a, or respondents, a list of techniques and asked them to indicate which ones they used. And then a subsequent question asked them to indicate which ones they thought should not be used to help people remember childhood sexual abuse. Those of you close enough to see the overhead can see that, for example, 29% reported use of hypnosis as a technique to help clients remember childhood sexual abuse, and 27% said that hypnosis should not be used as a means to help clients recover childhood sexual abuse, and so on down the list. Maybe just to clarify, regression refers to age regression technique. Guided imagery is a technique that is probably equivalent to hypnosis in many ways. Run wild refers to instructions to let your imagination run wild. And then we used that phrasing in the first survey. In the second one, we changed it to give free reign to the uh, imagination, and the reported use of that technique tripled when we called it free reign. Working at remembering or writing journals, um, dream interpretation, physical symptoms interpreted as indicators of abuse. Again, quite wide usage and, and quite limited agreement across respondents. Finally, the res majority of our respondents reported at least some cases in which clients who initially had said, no, nothing like that happened to me, subsequently came to uh, uh, remember instances of childhood sexual abuse. Not surprisingly, the rate of re reports of recovered memories was correlated with reported use of memory recovery techniques but interestingly, it was not correlated with respondents' uh, uh, indications of their theoretical orientation with their gender or with their nation, that is US versus British. 
The theory part is, is perhaps particularly surprising, but the explanation, I think, is fairly straightforward. Most of these respondents describe themselves as very eclectic. They checked off numerous techniques. So it appears that most, most practitioners view themselves as eclectic and therefore reported theoretical orientation doesn't seem to have much predictive value. Now, in a way, the results I've, I've told you about so far are the less scary results that have to do with the sort of majority of our respondents, the modal responses. Things get a little more scary when we looked at a subset of respondents who met some criteria. We defined as, in a rather ad hoc manner, I should admit, we defined as memory-focused practitioners who reported the following three things. They reported that they think it's important for clients with abuse histories to remember the abuse. They reported that they were sometimes fairly sure during the initial session with clients who said they had not been abused that in fact the client had been abused. And they reported use of two or more memory recovery techniques with the specific aim of helping clients recover memories of, of sexual abuse. So this is our criteria for these, uh, the subset of these highly trained psychotherapists who, whom we define as memory focused. In each of the three samples, 25% of the respondents met all three of these criteria. I expect to hear gasp when I say that. <laughs> Not surprisingly, all of these, uh, the subgroup reported at least some cases of memory recovery. And uh, uh, also not surprisingly, the reported rates of memory recovery were quite high. We asked different questions with regard to memory recovery in the two surveys. In survey one, we asked therapists, what percentage of the women clients whom you had suspected had hidden memories of abuse eventually came to remember abuse? And for this subgroup, the mean estimate was 60%. So more than half of the time when the practitioners in this subgroup thought that the client had hidden memories, the client, sure enough, had them. Responses on this item ranged as high as 100%. In survey two, we asked respondents, of all of your women clients who initially denied a history of childhood sexual abuse, what percentage eventually came to report memories of abuse, and uh, approximately a third, or the mean estimate was approximately one third of clients, and again, this ranged as high as 100% of women clients who had initially denied an abuse history. Been warned that I'm out of time. I hate that. <laughs> Very briefly, let me just run over this. As a cognitive psychologist or as a critic, it's easy to think, my goodness, where could these ideas come from? Where could these practices come from? But in fact, I think there are understandable sources of these beliefs and practices. One source is a long-standing historical tradition in psychotherapy and clinical psychology that emphasizes the idea that childhood trauma is an important source of adulthood psychopathology. Most of these practitioners would have been trained in schools that would emphasize this idea. Another important source of this is real childhood sexual abuse, the fact that lots and lots of people were sexually abused, and that sexual abuse does in fact have psychopathological sequelae. Putting those two together, it's easy to appreciate why we would get the recent promulgation of memory work, which has, has been sort of moved in on therapists from many uh, angles. 
I also believe that most practitioners have inadequate training in, sci in, in scientific methodology and reasoning, that most of them are completely untrained in re research on memory, and in particular memory errors and distortions. And there is also a variety of heuristics and biases that we all as humans are prone to that cons conspire together to uh, uh, lead us to have ill-placed beliefs. And these are things such as confirmation bias, uh, which can lead to illusory correlations. The representativeness heuristic, which is an idea that if things are similar, then they're probably causally related, which I think is why the only indicator listed by more than 16% uh, of respondents was adulthood sexual dysfunction. That is, there's that surface similarity that leads people to think it's a good indicator. We also tend, as humans, to be insensitive to the extent to which we influence others and to the extent to which others influence us. And as reasoners, we tend to be insensitive to base rates. We, we don't think about uh, probabilities when we make judgments. So these, I believe, are the sources of, of these potentially risky uh, techniques and practices. I should also mention in closing that the uh, relatively low response rate, 40%, allows for the possibility that our results exaggerate the use of memory recovery techniques and these beliefs in the population. There's some reasons we don't think that's true, but the fact is we'll give it to critics and say, let's assume that all of the people who didn't return the survey would have said, no, I don't do any of this stuff. The results would still be staggering. For example, we still have 10% of practitioners meeting all three of our uh, criteria. I should also mention that the quantitative results don't make it clear whether therapists are using these techniques in highly single-minded, aggressive, wildly suggestive ways, or in more open-minded, cautious ways. We just don't know about that, and I suspect it's a blend of each. Nonetheless, the results do reveal that a substantial percentage of highly trained psychotherapists in the U.S. and Britain do make use of a variety of potentially risky memory recovery techniques. Thank you.